Try that. Okay, so project two, selling out. I'll walk you through this one here. So the idea here is a uh, is a single page application, or well, or or moreover a um, a single product page for a web store for a, a web store application. So imagine that you're working with a or building out an e-com kind of uh, uh, in an e-com kind of context, and you need to design a single page for a product. So this is the point where you have searched for the through the various product categories. You've listed through the uh, subcategories. You've found the product you're looking for. You've clicked through, and now you have a picture of the product. You have the modifiers, like different colors and sizes you want, a description of the product, similar products like this. You know that kind of page I'm talking about, right? I'll, I'll show you, and I'll you demonstrate. Like Walmart.com. Go to anything that sells online. Drill down to, it, to as, as deeply as you can to a specific SKU, a very particular product, and that is what I'm talking about. Right. So and, and and I think this is a good exercise. I think it's because in so describing a single product, you're going to have to consider all of the things that we've talked about this term. But right? you're going to have to consider navigation. Right. How, how do I offer the global navigation for the rest of the website? How does that how do I hold that in? How do I think about sub navigation? Because I drilled down to uh, a certain point in the website. So where would I maybe I, I mean, menswear, I'm looking at. Uh, at hoodies or something like that, and how where would I put the secondary navigation or sub, you know, how would that look, right? Um, uh, you know, things like uh, like tab panels. Um, how would I look at the layout in terms of, uh, you know, in a small screen, in a single column view for a phone, and then how would I, as as the as the page expands, how would I rearrange things to take advantage of more real estate on the screen? So. Um, <clears throat> So and 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 look at for inspiration, you know, look at um, a number of product. Look at look at Amazon. Look at at uh, a future shop, future shop, Best Buy. Now, future shop, so long. Um, you know, uh, and and get a sense of how they've laid these things out. And so that so the good stuff is what we call above the fold, right? So the real important stuff about the product, and the most importantly, add to cart button is above. The fold where the person would have to scroll down to get. Um, think about um, starting this on paper. So what I mean is, it's really easy and quick to make some decisions and throw designs away on paper, right? Just you know, grab a, a piece of paper out of the inkjet printer and put it sideways, and then just start sketching out your thoughts. You know, oh, that's not going to work, and that's not going to work, right? So pretend this. Pretend this is the browser window on a desktop. Very easy to uh, you know to go through several design iterations without even touching a line of code, you know before you before you start committing to CSS or HTML or JavaScript. Uh, <clears throat> so make sure all the HTML is crafted out in some and, and think about semantics. You know just because we're we're focusing on CSS doesn't mean I'm not looking for really really clean, well formatted semantically meaningful HTML. I always that is the that is the framework that is the those are the steel girders upon which your design is is created, right? You need a nice good strong building before you decide on wallpaper or or uh, you know <coughs> floor coverings. Um, and make sure it's free of errors. Uh, and in so passing through all of your your project ones, I'm I'm very encouraged. I think you guys are doing some really good work. I'm seeing people are remembering to put the Lang attribute, they're remembering their character encoding, they're remembering to put in the uh, meta viewport tag. So I'm seeing all the good stuff. So you guys are doing a great job. Keep that up, right? <clears throat> um, it's, it's really easy to miss one of those kind of fundamental bits and then struggle with the rendering because your character encoding isn't working or because you know there's something weird going on with, with zooming in a, in a mobile or a touch screen because you don't have the meta, the meta viewport tag in, in place. Or there's something weird going on with your normalization, your your CSS, because you've normalized, you've done normalization after you've applied your base styles. And there's something, there's something overriding your own styles, right? It's just simply a matter of normalize first, then, and then pull in your your uh, your own custom CSS. So just check all those kind of simple things first, uh, you know, before you uh, before you get get into the crazy stuff. Um, 
yeah, you know, so think about typography, think about colors, background images. If you're pulling in uh, web fonts, you know, from a font service or from, or you're pulling in at font page, you've used apps, font scroll, font scroll to pull down a font. Make sure those paths are right. So make sure the, the fonts are, are, you know, the paths to those font files are so that they actually render. Um, but I want you to, as much as possible, make it look like a real product page, right? Um, here's some ideas to, to take it a little bit further. Um, you know, and I see some people attempting now, uh, I see lots of people trying, uh, working with the grid, that's that's awesome, and working with Flexbox, that's awesome. I still see, see some people working with floats and clears, and there's nothing wrong with floats and clears, but it's just, uh, it's it's harder. It's actually more difficult at this point to make a, a, a complicated responsive layout with floats and clears. It's gonna be more unstable. It's just things are gonna break more easily, right? So I would encourage you, if you're, if you're, if you're using floats and clears, Take a little bit of time to just get some practice with Flexbox and, and, and Grid. Circle back to some of those little tutorial things. Follow some of the links through on MDN. They point you to some other great tutorials. Flexbox and Grid are, are not that hard. And, in, and, and once you get it, they're way more easy to manage and they're way more stable when you start resizing the screen. Things don't, things don't fall apart, right? Um, so yeah, really consider if you haven't made the move over to Grid or Flexbox, do that for your layout. Okay, so uh, I don't care. It, it has to be posted on a server. I don't care what server you throw it up on. It doesn't matter to me. Um, and here's where I'm looking at. This is what I'm looking at from uh, from a technical perspective. So fonts, uh, suitable structural elements. Uh, this I you know I would I'm gonna I should probably change this to flexbox or grid. Um, make sure there's a little simple add to cart feature. So build a small form. Right, that allows the person to actually add the element to cart. None of this can be, uh, you know, it, it, we're just looking at a functional prototype, right? We're looking at a. Um, I'm sure that we put the auto thing in there again, like we had to do for the product one. I suggest in case. Like a, like a captcha? No, well, the last one we just did because it was our favorite product. Yeah. We had to put in that line you said. Just, um, oh, robots. Robots, that's it. Yeah, I, mean, I for taking that's someone probably else, for a taking good someone else's product off their page. That's probably a rebuilding it. Yeah, and then putting it into any server. Yeah, because you're might possibly be found in some types of fishing rods. That's a good point. I will add that just because that that kind of turns the search engines away. Yeah, because I don't want you to be indexed if you're using. Yeah, if you're using a product that you that's didn't, already that's already internet. existing. Yes, because you if you build your HTML properly, you will perform really well on the search engines. And I will get in trouble. Just trying <laughs> to help you out. It's here. good. No, no, keeping me out of legal trouble. I don't like calls from lawyers. That's cool. You know, <laughs> they're great folks. Um, I, that's a good point. I, I'll add the I'll add the little uh, text for the rope the meta robots to turn them away. No, but generally speaking, an add to cart is a small form in the page, right? Because you've got, you're gonna have the, the name of the, of the you're gonna have the, some, maybe some product modifiers, like three different color choices. Maybe if say it's a t-shirt, you're gonna have the sizes in a select box. And then when you have add to cart, you want those, that to do something. That will go up to the server, generally speaking with the, whether you're working with Magento or Shopify or whatever the, the, the CMS is or the, it will, it will, it's still a form, right? You're still capturing user data and and posting that or using post or get to a form. But, you don't want it but I don't need it functional. I just need you to build me the form, and the action attribute on the form can be null. No. Doesn't matter. <clears throat> I'm looking for design. I'm looking at the the layout. I, I'm, I'm I'm focusing on front end, and I'm not I'm not. We're not tying this into to the back end at this point. <clears throat> um, so make sure there's lots of good use of white space. Typography is well thought out, right? Good type uh, choice uh, font, font faces. Uh, use, um, you know, use maybe a, a, a font for, think about, look up font pairings, right? A lot of good font uh, sites will talk about pairings in terms of, well, if you use this for a body copy, this is a nice, for, the heading should, would look good in this particular face. If you, if you like this heading, this would be a good body copy for that. So. Um, Try to stick to, to one or two fonts. Start, when you start getting into three or four different font faces, it starts to look a little bit disjointed, 
right? Uh, it's, you know, too much of a good thing is just too much. So um, think about that, exercise restraint. Um, innovative or imaginative components to the page, you know, think about those back to top buttons we built, right? Think about incorporating something fun functionality like that. Think about, uh, think about uh, you know, persistent headers. We've talked about that. Think about little touches to the UI that make it, because the, the product page may be quite involved, right? You have, if you think about a typ typical product page, so here I'll go down to even, uh, let's go to Best Buy. What are we buying today? Let's talk about a, let's talk about an Android tablet. Say you want to buy one of these. Galaxy Tab A. Oh, this looks like a good, good deal. Might be a little underpowered, but that's all right. So here, so there's our, our there's our product, right? There's our add to cart. <clears throat> In this case, um, there's three options. You can add you can add mobile plans, I guess. Put a SIM card in there. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's no reason why you can't add some. Uh, you know, uh, look at some of the stuff we've done. You've learned in in the JavaScript class with with photo galleries, and do something, so not unlike that, right? Um, um, you might also like section. Uh, look at the brand. Look at the notice. The navigation here is persistent, right? Um, down here we have uh, a tab panel here. <clears throat> I'm gonna figure. I have to figure out a way to fold in uh, building a tab panel because that's that's a really useful uh, design pattern here. Um, and then there's other stuff, of course. This just keeps on going and going and going. It, it does not need to be that involved. Um, you know. And you don't need to write real content. Feel free to use Greek text or lorem ipsum, or if you want to use any variant thereof. Yeah, um, you don't need to get uh, do any kind of writing. I'd rather see you use um, bogus text than <clears throat> than actually copy text from a from a production website. Just use placeholder text. A, a section for user comments. Sure, absolutely, right. <clears throat> And there you go. So that, and then of course a, a footer, some sort of corporate footer at the bottom would be helpful. <clears throat> and think about, of course, uh, doing going from a mobile. They don't do a good job of mobile first here, do they? Huh. You don't care if you want you to come in. They had a website for mobile. Oh, they have a special. Yeah, they see, that's 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 where I'd like you to get away from that, right? I don't want people to be. Maintaining two different code bases, one for a mobile site and one for, and well, that's what we're talking about today. We're going back. We're going to talk again about mobile first today, and building one code base that serves every all devices. So here we'll. What am I looking for? I need a new pair of hiking boots. Mine are dead. How about that? <clears throat> Let's see what they got here. All right, those look like good boots. So we hit drill down to the product. Here we've got. So here's a this form in particular. Yeah, if you think of an add to add to product add to cart form, you're going to have maybe a, a quantity incrementer or decrementer. You'll have, you know, a size, so you know, colors, things like that. So this this here is a simple form, right? Um, image gallery, description, text specs here, uh, be a table. We're going to talk about tables and laying out tables. I've, I've held off on any meaningful discussion about tables so far. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the cool things we can do with tables and CSS uh, next week. So um, things, oh, you liked this product, you might also like, is very common. Um, let's see Let's see what kind of, uh, how they've done mobile here. Eh, sort of, eh, it's not too bad. Yeah, that's not bad. There's their take on a mobile. Menu, so that's that's not too bad in terms of responsiveness, right? Cool. And you have the rest of the term to do it. Okay, um, that's it. Cool. Selling out. You're not really selling out. I just said that was funny. So, okay, that's cool. <clears throat> let's head over to. Let's talk about mobile again today. So mobile first, module 12. What do I got left in my battery?
All right, we're gonna first we're gonna talk about first we're gonna talk about spaghetti sauce. Four forty two. Four four. He said, Mr. Moskowitz, Dr. Moskowitz, want to make the perfect pickle. He said, there is no perfect pickle. There are only perfect pickles. And he came back to him and he said, you don't just need to improve your regular. You need to create zesty. And that's where we got zesty pickles. Then the next person came in, and that was Campbell's Soup. This was even more important. In fact, Campbell's Soup is where Howard made his reputation. Campbell's made Prego. And Prego in the early 80s was struggling next to ragu, which was the dominant spaghetti sauce of the 70s and 80s. Now, in the industry, I don't know whether you care about this or how much time I have to go into this, but it was, technically speaking, inside, Prego is a better tomato sauce than ragu. The quality of the tomato paste is much better, the spice mix is far superior, it adheres to the pops in a much more pleasing way. In fact, they would do the famous bowl test back in the 70s with ragu and Prego. You have a plate of spaghetti and you would pour it on, right? And the ragu would all go to the bottom, and the prego would sit on top. It's called adherence. And anyway, despite the fact that they were far superior in adherence and the quality of their tomato paste, prego was struggling. So they came to Howard and they said, fix us. And Howard looked at their product line and he said, what you have is a dead potato society, a dead tomato society. So he said, this is what I want to do. And he got together with the Kendall Soup Kitchen and he made 45 varieties of spaghetti sauce. And he varied them according to every conceivable way that you can vary tomato sauce. By sweetness, by level of garlic, by tartness, by sourness, by tomatoiness, by visible solids, my favorite term in this <laughs> spaghetti sauce business. Every conceivable way you can vary spaghetti sauce, he varied spaghetti sauce. And then he took this whole wrap of 45 spaghetti sauces and he went on the road. He went to New York, he went to Chicago, he went to Jacksonville, he went to Los Angeles. And he brought in people by the truckload, in the big halls. And he sat them down for two hours and he gave them over the course of that two hours ten bowls. Ten small bowls of pasta with a different spaghetti sauce on each one. And after they ate each bowl, they were at to rate from zero to hundred how good they thought the spaghetti sauce was. At the end of that process, after doing it for months and months, he had a mountain of data about how the American people feel about spaghetti sauce. And then he analyzed the data. Now, did he look for the most popular brand variety of spaghetti sauce? No. Howard doesn't believe that there is such a thing. Instead, he looked at the data and he said, let's see if we can group these different, all these different data points into clusters. Let's see if they congregate around certain ideas. And sure enough, if you sit down and you analyze these, all this data on spaghetti sauce, you realize that all Americans fall into one of three groups. There are people who like this spaghetti sauce plain, there are people who like this spaghetti sauce spicy, and there are people who like it extra chunky. And of those three facts, the third one was the most significant. Because at the time, in the early 1980s, if you went to a supermarket, you would not find extra chunky spaghetti sauce. And Prego turned to Howard and they said, you're telling me that one third of Americans crave extra chunky spaghetti sauce, and yet no one is servicing their needs? And he said yes. And Prego then went back and completely reformulated their spaghetti sauce and came out with a lot of extra chunky that immediately and completely took over the spaghetti sauce business in this country. And over the next 10 years, they made $600 million off their line of extra chunky sauces. And everyone else in the industry looked at what Howard had done, and they said, oh my god, we've been thinking all along. And that's when you started to get seven different kinds of mango, and 14 different kinds of, of mustard, and 71 different kinds of olive oil, and, and then eventually even ragu. I, Howard, and Howard did the exact same thing for ragu. He did for Prego. Today, if you go to the supermarket, a really good one, and you look at how many ragus there are, do you know how many are? 36. In six varieties, cheese, light, robusta, rich and hearty, old world traditional, 
extra chunky garden. <laughs> That's how it's doing. That is how it gets to the American people. Now, why is that important? It is, in fact, enormously important. I'll explain to you why. Because what Howard did is he fundamentally changed the way the food industry thinks about making you happy. Assumption number one in the food industry used to be that the way to find out what people want to eat, what will make people happy, is to ask them. And for years and years and years and years, Ragu and Prego would have focus groups. And they would sit all you people down and they would say, what do you want in a spaghetti sauce? Tell us what you want in a spaghetti sauce. For all those years, 20, 30 years, through all those focus group sessions, no one ever said they wanted extra chunky. Even though at least a third of them deep in their hearts actually did. <laughs> people don't know what they want. Right? As Howard loves to say, the mind knows not what the tongue wants. It's a mystery. It's an, an incredibly important step in understanding our own desires and taste is to realize that we cannot always explain what we want to. If I asked all of you, for example, in this room, what you want in a coffee, you know what you'd say? Every one of you would say, I want a dark, rich, hearty roast. So people always say when you ask them what you want in a coffee, what do you like? Dark, rich, hearty roast. What percentage of you actually like a dark, rich, hearty roast? According to Howard, somewhere between 25 and 27 percent. Most of you like milky wheat coffee. <laughs> but you will never ever say to someone who asks you what you want that I want a milky wheat coffee. So that's number one thing that Howard did. Number two thing that Howard did is he, he made us realize, it's another very good one. He made us realize in the importance of what he likes to call horizontal segmentation. Why is this critical? It's critical because this is the way the food industry thought for Howard. What were they obsessed with in the early 80s? They were obsessed with mustard. In particular, they were obsessed with the story of Great Palm. Right? Used to be, there were two mustards, French's and Gold's. What were they? Yellow mustard. What's in yellow mustard? Yellow mustard seeds, turmeric, and paprika. That was mustard. Greg and Paul came along with a Dijon. Right? Much more of olive brown mustard seed, the white wine, the nose hips, much more delicate aromatics. And what did they do? They put it in a little tiny glass jar. Wonderful enamel flavor on it. Made it look French, even though it's made in Oxnard, California. <laughs> and instead of charging a dollar fifty for the eight ounce and the way the Red House bottle, the way that French is a golden stick, they decided to charge $4. And then they had those ads, right, with the guy in the Rolls Royce, and he's eating the Great Coupon, and the other Rolls Royce pulls up, and he says, GM the Great Coupon. And the whole thing, after they did that, Great Coupon takes off, takes over the mustard business. And everyone's take-home lesson from that was that the way to get to make people happy is to give them something that is more expensive, something to aspire to is to make them turn their back on what they like, think they like now, and reach out for something higher up the mustard hierarchy. <coughs> a better mustard, a more expensive mustard, a mustard of more sophistication and culture. And Howard looked at that and said, that's wrong. Mustard does not exist on a hierarchy. Mustard exists just like tomato sauce on a horizontal plane. There is no good mustard or bad mustard. There is no perfect mustard or imperfect mustard. There are only different kinds of mustards that suit different kinds of people. He fundamentally democratized the way we think about taste. And for that as well, we owe Helen Moskowitz a huge way of things. <clears throat> I'll let you watch the rest. It's very, it's, you should watch the whole thing. It's really quite awesome. But it's a really interesting. So he talks about that horizontal segmentation, right? We don't want, we don't know what we want. <clears throat> and so. Say you're at Mount. I'm not. I'm going to pick on Mountain Equipment Co-op. They're a good store, but I'll pick on them. We don't. I don't know what I want when I go in there, and when I'm expecting to learn a little bit more, I pull up my whatever I have in my pocket. Right. I don't know how I want that laid out. I don't know how I want my information organized. I just want my information. Right. So. So if you snap this page over into responsive mode here is our horizontal segmentation. You'll get one of these experiences, depending on the, on the device you want, right? There is no best layout. 
just like he talked about the tomato sauce, right? And, you know, and, and kind of like that, that I think it was funny you talked about, he talked about mustard. I think that's the kind of the way we all also taught about, about web applications, right? Um, you know, there's, there's, there's this, we've got this beautiful desktop experience and wow, you know, the people who are browsing a mobile, well, they need a special mobile site. So we need to recapture some, capture the user string when they request the page. Oh, you're on a mobile site. Okay. So we will redirect you to this kind of watered down kind of, uh, version of the site pared down and the, eliminated some of the graphics and some of the features and kind of give you a very kind of, I don't know, bare bones experience, right? Where, where some of the information may not even be there, right? So, you know, we need to do kind of what I think uh, Howard Moskowitz did to the, when we're thinking about, particularly about mobile, we need to recognize um, we can't know what the end user wants, right? So we have to think about, well, you know, we have to think about these things. We also have to think about, I don't know whether the user prefers browsing horizontally or vertically. I don't know that. I can't make that assumption, right? Um, but a certain, a certain number of people are going to hold the phone this way. And I thought it was really interesting. I was, uh, on the weekend, I was at an event and Snow Valley had the end of season thing. They had a big ice puddle and, and everyone was kind of got into their uh, board shorts and went down the hill and into this big icy puddle of water, right? To celebrate the end of the season. So, so, so my son decides to sign up for this thing on a snowboard. I, know, I would never do this, but he thought this was try it. <laughs> Maybe next year I'll try it. Do you um, or ski? I, 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 do I, I ski. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. Try so it. anyway, it's so much easier. But, but I was behind the camera. So, so I was filming the event and I, I was filming it sideways, right? In landscape view. So I capture the video in landscape. And one of uh, my son's friends was filming it in portrait. And I've always thought, I'm like, you, one, you should, I said, I said, Evan, you should, you should capture your stuff horizontally, right? You, you shouldn't be capturing it in portrait. And, uh, and I said, and, and the photographs, this drives me nuts. People are taking pictures this way with their camera. I think you should take them this way because when you review the camera, with the pictures, you go and sit down in the family room with all your family, and you, you cast it to the TV and you've got a, 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 a horizontal television. He said, Scott, when I take this video, my friends are going to be viewing it on Instagram and they're going to be holding their phone this way. And I, and I realized I, I was projecting my own kind of bias, but he's totally right. He was, he was thinking about the intended audience for that and that's the experience they were looking for. So he produced the videos, his videos, vertically. No one was going to go down and sit in front of the television. Right? That's what mom and dad did. <laughs> so there you go, right? I, I mean, I should listen to my own advice. So, so anyway, I thought I said, you, you know, I learned something. That's that's really important. So, so we really we can't assume what we we know, and we can't assume what we like is what other people like. We have to design when we're thinking about mobile first. It's not really mobile first, and people will talk about mobile first, and you know they'll say, you know, responsive design or mobile first. I'm not sure any of those, I think those terms will kind of fade away. I think they're kind of trendy. I think the main point is we have to try and plan for any possible user interface scenario and adapt our, make sure our, adapt, our designs are liquid enough that they will reflow into that page so that they'll make sense in that context. And that just, it takes a little bit more thought. You know, designing for li in a liquid sense is hard. Like if I know I've got a fixed height and width, and this is what I'm designing for, an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. To some degree, that's very simple. That's not to denigrate you know, graphic design, the graphic design folks who bring us all kinds of great, uh, great designs. But, but in a sense, you've taken away a lot of variables when you say, this is what you're designing for, right? We don't have that benefit. We, I'm saying design for, I don't know, everything, whatever. Well, what, what are the, I was like, I don't know what the canvas is going to look like. Design for all of them, right? That's in effect why what we do is so difficult because we have very little control, if any, over what kind of, whether it's a horizontal experience, I guess, in landscape or portrait, vertical, and then much less, you know, it's crazy. So I, I think nowadays, I think the best approach, and this, this will probably change as, as time goes on, right? So don't, 
don't listen to this and say, well, you know, Scott said this. Well, you have to remember, you're going to have to leave here and, and two to five years forget everything that Scott said because it's all going to change again anyway, right? So, but I think for now, a really, a, when we talk about mobile first, I think what we have to do is to say, okay, let's create a terrific experience in a small, when we don't have a lot of space on the screen. Make that experience great. And then if we have the benefit of more screen real estate, take advantage of that, but make sure that the small screen experience is complete. You've got all the features people need. They're, they're you know, for the most part, they're above the fold, so we don't need to do a lot in the way of, uh, of scrolling to get at really um, critical features, like in this case here. Uh, you know, now you've got the name of the product, and you've got the, it doesn't touch, does it? Um, um, so, uh, you know, we've got we've got the, the name of the product, and we've got the great big shiny picture. That that's the important thing, right there. Right, that's what people need to see. So, make this experience terrific. Make sure the the navigation's all there, the branding's all in place. Make it great. And then, if we can, if we have more space, awesome. You know, pull that other stuff up here. Add, pull the add to cart button up around the side here. You know, if we've got even more space, terrific. You know, give them a bigger picture. Do something, but but don't treat people with small screens like second-class citizens. Because, and I'll show you why. <clears throat> so here is current data on desktop versus desktop versus mobile versus tablet. This is today. Well, you know, February 2019. So here we have the desktop is the blue, and our mobile is green. So we're right about even. Right? <clears throat> Look at our tablet down here. That's weird. Right? People are either seem to be in sitting at, at, at home or in their office on a desk, or they seem to be out and about with Something that isn't a terribly large screen. I, I would say a tablet is a medium-sized screen in a loose kind of way, but look at that. That's pretty interesting, right? So as often as not, your user, and sometimes more often, your user is going to be on the small screen, not on the big screen. Let's make that experience great, okay? So <clears throat> there is no best layout. There's the best layouts. Just like we talked about, uh, about uh, you know, Howard Moskowitz's spaghetti sauce, right? So um, <clears throat> think of, when you go to the grocery store, you look at all the spaghetti sauces, that's the way I want you to think about UI design. There isn't one best one, right? Certain people will like certain things, and that's okay. That's cool. <clears throat> and then hopefully we can get away from maintaining. And if you go to work, and you're sitting, and you're working in an organization that still cling on to this belief that the desktop experience is the best experience, and will just kind of give this kind of, We'll do a sort of mobile friendly edition. It's your job to educate people. Help them realize the benefits of serving those, uh, you know, <clears throat> you'll be like, more than half of your audience wants this. And you're giving them that. Help them realize this, right? They'll be like, whoa, geez, you're kidding me. Yeah. And, and then you can talk about also the benefits of maintaining one code base rather than two. The savings are there. I mean, a little bit of upfront investment. But over the long long term, maintaining one website versus two web applications, those savings will add up pretty fast. That return on that investment will be pretty quick. Right? <clears throat> so that's why we spend time on uh, looking at you know, things like media queries, looking at things like Flexbox and Grid. That's why we spend all the time and effort. Not because it's easy, but because it's hard. But the benefits are there. Like once you get once you figure out how to reflow content. And you know, into different devices, uh, you have tremendous power. So, to that end, <clears throat> pull down our pull down our lesson twelve files. Track <clears throat> them out. No, nope, not Edge. Not oh, there's anything wrong with Edge. Let's open this with.
Malcolm Gladwell. That guy's awesome. Okay, so we should have mobile first. And I, I'm using some uh, some placeholder images. If you're designing um, what we call, and I'll call this a functional prototype. If you're designing functional prototypes, a couple of things. One, I would encourage you to eliminate color from, from, from your initial, because color is distracting when you're sitting there with a bunch of people talking about, well, do you like this? They'll be like, I don't like that color of orange. That's nasty. You're like, I'm not talking about that. Let's look at the layout. Eliminate color and also eliminate pictures where you can't. So when you, if you're, if you can use, um, uh, I think it's called, I think they changed the name. It used to be placehold.it, placehold.it. <clears throat> it's called placeholder.com um, now. So if you use a, an image placeholder service like this to serve up uh, just like empty images, that will help you with, as you get through your design iterations and you're working with your team because you put a real picture up there, even if it's a stock image, it's obviously a generic image. People get really hyper focused on those, and they're like, "I, I don't like her hair. That's that looks uh, that looks really dated. I, I don't think that's cool." And you're like, "I'm not talking about her hair. We're talking about the layout here." And they just they, they won't they'll fixate on it. Yeah, through that, just put a picture of your own face. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> that well, I don't know. That'll be distracting for me, right? <laughs> so. Use yeah. Try it when you're talking about just layout and build, building those layout of those those, uh, those kind of wireframes. We're we're essentially doing what, what's called a mid fidelity prototype, right? So a low fidelity prototype would be something on on a piece of paper, right? A sketch of of what the design will look like. Here's the image. Here's what the nav bar will look like. Here's the and and a mid fidelity prototype might be something that you know um, doesn't have maybe real content in it but it could be built with like this in HTML CSS and a high fidelity contact, uh, pro, uh, prototype would be something that is built maybe in, in using HTML CSS I guess maybe with taken with a bit of you know actually real branding and Im branding images and colors you get the, the branding in there maybe you use some stock photography and maybe you pull in some real copy to give people a real sense of okay the finished product is gonna look like this and then that's further along in that design in those, in, so, so in terms of iterative design, we might be midway when we're doing something like this. Um, so if you look at the, the markup, um, <clears throat> we've got a header, a main, and a footer. That's all we got, right? So the header inside here, we have an H1, uh, an, uh, a global nav in the nav element. We'll use the, uh, we'll use the, um, a uh, hamburger uh, menu approach like we've used before to serve up the nav. The main here we have uh, four sections, each one with a, an image and some text under it and a heading. Right? So each of these sections are the same, uh, a subhead, a placeholder image, and a paragraph. So all four of those are the same. And then our footer, uh, we just have some small text there. I, that should be surrounded by the paragraph. That's it. So there's no tricks with the markup. Super clean uh, markup. Did you specifically add a div? Did you just want a blurb inside of that div? What was around that area then? <coughs> A div is a sectioning element, right? So the, the, the intent with a sectioning element, it may not technically fail validation, but what you've missed out on then is semantics. So the purpose of something like a div uh, or a section element or an article element is that you're, it, it's kind of like a, you're drawing, you're putting those, those are the bigger size boxes that you're drawing around your content. So if you think about it in terms of a wireframe, you're like, this is where our top stories are over here. Here's the, the national news stories. Here are the international stories. Here are uh, Ontario's or local stories. So those, those would be three different sections that you might have inside the main element. So the intent is that there you would drill down to further more specific uh, grant. The content would become more granular within and those sectioning elements. Yeah. So you would put I would, yeah. And, and, and you may, because the, the intent is, um, you could throw content in in a div or a section, but it lacks. And for example, you may get a warning in a validator. So so say I put a section together, and I and even I have a paragraph, a few paragraphs in there. 
You don't throw a warning, even though it's not an error. They'll say, consider putting a heading in a section. So, because if you if you if you've sectioned out, if you've got enough content that it needs, it merits having different sections. What it's saying is, semantically speaking, shouldn't those sections have some sort of identifier for them? And so that's where where those warnings come in helpful. It's not broken. It's not a broken DOM from a technical perspective, but from a, a content and a human interpretation perspective. Someone trying to understand the content, it, it could be better. That's also what I was wondering. Would like a screen reader not know that it's a paragraph with a paragraph tag? Probably like custom buttons. Yeah, you'd have to test it and see. It depends on what screen reading context you're, you're in, and those change quite a bit. Um, I don't know so much about that, and and, and uh, you know, the air, the accessible, rich internet applications, ARIA specification will say use the role attribute for certain things if you really need that that um, come down to a screen reader describing that appropriately. Um, yeah, but I think try as you get down to the, the the actual text nodes in your content, think about being fairly granular, sort of like what is this. Sentence like is it a is it a tagline for a logo? Is it just a piece of content in an article? What's the purpose of that content? I think is only maybe the best answer for that. Oh, I am totally in the wrong file. File. Uh, file. Open folder. Oh, because I've still got less than ten last year's. This desktop is very, first, but I mean, very you know, persistent. <laughs> it should look like, yes, yeah, so we should have a, a CSS directory with normalize, and we should have indexed that. How about that? All right. <clears throat> All right, step one, add the viewport meta tag. So let's go in here. Let's make sure we, you're in developer mode um, here. And, and actually, I'm going to. Yeah, I'll leave this here. Um, so open up the page, right click the page, hit inspect again, and then make sure that you, um, over here, uh, I want you to, to hit the toggle device toolbar, that little button there. That allows it, us to pop, um, change it just from a kind of a regular context into a kind of an emulator. And then, of course, you have your, your responsive view, or if you really need to simulate a specific device, there's the Pixel 2. Right. The, the, the benefit to the responsive here, using the responsive here, is they put up these, um, I still, do they put the, the breakpoints? Yeah, they still leave the breakpoints up here. Um, but you've got, um, you, know, you, can, you can look at uh, screen zoom, you can look at, uh, it reports all this, and you can resize these if you want. Right? That's, that's the kind of benefit to doing that. So... <clears throat> So, so put that in there. So let's imagine, and then let's hit the mobile small. So we're going to start here with our mobile small screen. Let's start with the small experience and go from there. Okay. So get get that set up in, and in this case, there's no. Uh, I'll I'll use Chrome. I think the 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 dev tools for mobile emulation in Chrome are are really spectacular, but. You know, um, I encourage you to use other others, um, other browsers as well. Let's take a look at, for example, here's uh, pull up the inspector here. Is this the mobile thing here? Responsive design mode. So here's responsive design mode in Firefox. I'll put this over to the side, and then we can compare. Like this is fantastic as well, right? Um, no device selected. The tools are all the same there. They're just different spots. Pretty cool. <clears throat> Outstanding. Step one, uh, add the viewport meta tag. So let's take a look and see what this does to the page. So we'll add the meta, <coughs> meta name equal viewport content equal comma initial 
scale equal 1.0. bolt that in. Um, <clears throat> and I would do that really, I mean, you've got your character encoding. Don't forget your, your base language for the page. If it's French, it's FR, you know, if it's Spanish, it's ES. Uh, you put the international code in there. Your character encoding and your title first things are in your head section. And then it really, it, it's it's not a bad idea to, do, to address uh, mobile. Um, you know, the, the, the this width equal device width, that basically gets the device rendering in CSS pixels rather than trying to pretend it's a it's a it's a fully featured desktop and making the screen <laughs> so tight crunching the full desktop experience into that tiny screen you've all seen that and you're like what the heck and then you got to pinch and zoom out and then you can't you're horizontally scrolling everywhere it's a mess right so this kind of addresses that kind of situation right off the bat so if we save this and then we take a look and reload the page you'll see that right away makes it more usable without doing anything. It's just raw HTML, right? <clears throat> I haven't even normalized yet. And let's take a look at, here's Firefox. Ooh. Change a couple of things. This was this stayed reasonably the same. So this is just their, uh, this is just their regular, uh, I guess we, we call this their, their responsive mode because there's no device selected here. <clears throat> Um, cool. So normalize the CSS, absolutely. Then, of course, and, and uh, I'm glad to see everyone. Really, you guys are really doing a good job now of normalizing before your your custom styles. Uh, so link that. And then just ch check and see how that changes things, right? A little bit of change. Uh, we got rid of mostly the, the biggest change you'll see is the is the removal of the on the body of the, any margin or padding, right? That will be our job with layout. I want to zero that stuff out. That's a good thing actually, even though it looks kind of even though it looks kind of nasty. That's a good thing. We have now we have control over the over the layout. <clears throat> so there you go. Now we're we've. Uh, uh, of course, here's our custom styles, which I will move into an external style sheet. But as you know, I like to build everything kind of on one page, on one template. Um, so this here, that is the bare minimum when I'm looking. Uh, I've also seen a, a couple of people well-intentioned, but um, if you put a comment before your doc type, you could introduce some rendering issues. Um, you know, people said it's really, you know, they put a comment in front of the doc type. It's really important for the doc type. Yes, that's true. But don't put, talk about that after you put the doc type in. So even putting a comment in there can sometimes uh, throw a, a rendering, a wrench into things. So doc type should be first, first before anything, comments, white space, anything. Just put that at the top. So make sure your lang's there. Make sure your character encoding and title are the first two things in your head. And then make sure we have your viewport tag and your normalization then your base styles, then JavaScript libraries with, with uh, if you put them up top, use the, use the defer, right? So that's what I want to see on all your stuff. What other doc types? What, are, what else do you What other doc types? Yeah. So this is the HTML5 doc type, and it's kind of confusing because it, it doesn't speak to what type of HTML that is, right? So... The idea when we when we when we went from XHTML to HTML5, we said okay. We realized that that HTML is a very organic and fluid language. It's changing all the time. In fact, it's we can codify it as version five. Right now we're at 5.1. You can think about it that way, or you can just say it's HTML, man. Okay, but right. And then so the idea is the only reason that's there is to address the, the, the fact that browsers used to have a legacy rendering mode or quirks mode for before we behaved ourselves with HTML and CSS. It was very forgiving, if you would. And then we have a standards mode where it snaps into standards mode and now the rules, the, the syntactical rigor and the rules of CSS rendering apply. And you're saying, look, I know what I'm doing. Let's do this right. And so that would be a standards mode, right? And, and I'll talk a little bit about this um, 
uh, we'll get it in step five. I don't have it. I don't have it here. I'll, I'll inject a little bit um, about halfway through this walkthrough, and I'll talk a little bit about I Internet Explorer and standard rendering mode. So I'm glad you brought that up. Okay. There will be a day, folks, when this goes away and you won't need it. I don't think that day will be too far out of, in the future. This will actually go away. This is a vestige of the past. So there will be a day when browsers do not require this and they will render in standards mode. And that's the plan, okay? But for now, today, 2019, use it. It puts, it makes sure the browser renders your CSS properly in, and it renders in standards mode, right? So, and some of these things will go away too. Like browsers will just say, we don't need this anymore. And I'll show you an example of something that we, you will still see, which actually we technically don't need anymore for Internet Explorer. So I'll come back to that. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so step three, apply our basic layout style. So um, let's, first of all, we're going to go in here to our, we're going to use border box styling rather than content box styling. And I see this more and more. I see this more and more. Oh, no, I put this in the wrong spot. It should be on, sorry. This should be on the HTML. <clears throat> I see this more and more just because it's a more um, intuitive way to size boxes, box model. You know, so this means that if you recall with our border box, so content box sizing would be, um, say we have an element here. Um, say I have a box that's 100 pixels wide. Right? right, with content box sizing, if I add padding, padding goes on the outside, and if I add a border, it goes on the outside as well, right? So then I would have to add, say the padding here was, was 10 px, and then this was five. I have to add for the full width of the, of the box, I would have five to 10, 15, 30, so it'd be 130 pixels wide. Even though I said with 100 px. This is content box size, and this is the default, right? The benefit to border box sizing is this. So I say, and if I say the box is 100 pixels wide, okay, and then I add padding, and then I add a border, say I add a border here, and I add padding inside that, and then I have my content in here, my text node, right? So this could be, this uh, border could be 5px. This padding could be 10px. But to the outside of the border, it will add that to the inside, squashing the content. So that means the box will still be, when I say width, 100% or 100 pixels, it'll be 100 pixels. That's the difference, right? People are really gravitating around toward this rather than this. So you'll see this more and more. I, I, I used to design this way. I'm more comfortable in this environment, but I'm trying to rewire my brain to think about this. Because I think, and this is the way we thought about things about 20 years ago, when we first started to do layout in CSS. We did this, I think we did this in, in Netscape Navigator and this in Internet Explorer, which were the only two flavors we had back then. <laughs> we did, this was, this was Netscape, this was IE. So we had to write our CSS twice to get our layout. Oh yeah, they were dark times. Right? That's why. That's why I think if you, back you see the flat screens and the remote control back in the CRT days, yeah. So if you, I think if, this is why if you if you know web developers from who've been working from that, they have um, kind of cognitive problems, right? They have mental health issues. It's a lot of it's a lot of it stems from stuff like this, right? Uh, it was terrible. So um, really, I, I think it's a good practice here. The problem is that the box sizing property may not inherit. Um, so the, this, what this does here is we say box sizing, and we force that inheritance. So in all the, uh, so all the children. This means all elements like wildcard, everything, just inherit from their parent. And since the parent, the root node is box sizing board. That means everything. When you say 100 pixels wide, you say the width property. You get the width. That's what that does. I think it's it's just easier, right? Takes a little side over.
Yes. This this gets rid of this entirely. It's all this. You say width or height to an element, it'll be 100 pixels. You add border, a border of any width and any padding, it squash it fits it in the outside into the inside and squashes the content. It's, it makes for more stable layouts, right? Um, your content should be liquid enough, right, to do this. If this is the case, usually the height's auto, and you're just dealing, most of the time we deal with width and not height, so it'll just, it'll just adjust the height, reflow the text. You know, that's when things like hyphenation and things like that become important. Um, that's cool. So let's put um, some diagnostic mar uh, borders on our stuff here. So we'll put a, we'll put a border, a body, uh, let's say border. We're just gonna pound down the line and not go by numbers. Sorry? Pounding down the line today. Well, step three is that we're just gonna I'm just gonna parse through the basic building blocks there and add some diagnostic colors, and then I'll circle back to step four. Um, so border for the body, one px, uh, cut it red, and the header element. I'll do a border here as well. Oops. I should blue, just make them a little bit different. <clears throat> Let's get into our, so that's our header, just our main blocks, our header. Let's get into our sections. Uh, do I talk about the section? Oh, I don't really talk about the section element here at all. Let's go down to the main. Oh, head, header section footer. So our main element, element here, we'll put... Um, Order 1px uh, green. Where we put these for diagnostic stuff here. Uh, dashed orange and our footer. The nastier the colors are, the better. I guess I'm gonna. I'm overwriting my section. Did I put the section up here in the top? I think I did. Or the or the header? Did I put the header color up here? Yeah. So this will be overwritten here. So I'll get rid of this one because I'm doing all a group selector with header section footer will all be one dx dash orange. Oh. And then we can see the different bits in our <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> step three, step four. Build our media query breakout for bigger screens. So the beauty about of starting with the beauty of starting with a um, uh, with a mobile first first approach is most things are display uh, position static by default, right? So what that means is the order in which they appear in the HTML is the rendering order, and that actually works pretty nicely. Like right out of the box here, um, this is not a terrible experience for a mobile phone or, or for a mobile device of, of a small screen. And that's great. It's a single column view. Um, so <clears throat> rather than saying, you know, uh, at, at a certain size or smaller, let's rearrange things. Why don't we just assume the size is small and then move upwards and say, once we get to a certain size here, bigger, then let's look at maybe multiple columns or moving things so that we can take advantage of that additional width. So leave it. Let's, let's design first for small screen and make it a single column view that's very easy to get around. That's the intent behind mobile first is let's leave this as the default experience and our breakpoints we should set as minimums. So if we achieve a minimum width, for example, of 1024, okay, now we're in a desktop environment or a, or a, or a large tablet. So now we'll, t we'll make go to two columns and move upwards, right? And that's, a, it's a, it's not the way we used to do breakpoints. You could set a breakpoint where it's a 
you know, at minimum here and at maximum here. Um, but I think that takes a, a, a bit more, I think that can take a bit more work, but anyway, that doesn't matter. So step four, let's build a media query <clears throat> breakpoint for bigger screen. So for a two, for two column layout. So we'll say media, um, and this stuff here will also go away. So what this is here, when we do, at, we put the at media in here, only screen, uh, we actually don't need this, right? Um, it will still work if we just put media and then we put the, the min width. But the reason we put this is because uh, some older decrepit browsers, um, like IE 8 or 9, and you think, well, those are gone now. I don't count on it, right? Uh, large organizations still sometimes have these on their, on their images. They, they don't get media queries just right. They kind of break it. So the way we, we do this, like they'll try and do it and they'll, they'll, they'll do a horrible job and, and your content will become unreadable. So what this does is the screen property and the only uh, keyword here, they were later additions to the uh, at media queries um, uh, module in CSS. So they were later additions in the such sense that browsers that don't implement media queries properly don't understand this at all. They're like, what? Only screen? I don't, I don't get it. I'm out. And they tap out at that point. So it kind of puts a wall up in front of bad browsers. I shouldn't say bad, but bad browsers that can't do media queries properly. So it, it, it's a way of filtering out those and only allowing good browsers, where I say browsers that can do it, access to these properties here. Okay? But a day will come when those browsers fall off the face of the earth and we don't need to do this anymore, right? As always, we live in transitional times. So, so the only keyword is not used for like only print, only print media. If you have that media print, that works. Yeah, like if you have at media print, you don't need to put only print. Okay, that's okay. it's it's kind of it's sort of a hack. Like, there's nothing wrong with using only if you really like, if it's really important that like if this is only speech. We can use, uh, you know, if, it's, if we're, we're doing about styles for spoken word, because there's a, you know, there's a speech module, and yes, we've used that in our JavaScript class. Um, that can certainly turn away browsers that are rendering the screen context. So there's nothing wrong with using it. It's, it's, it's not a very often used piece. In this context, we're just using it to turn away browsers that are broken in terms of screen reading. <clears throat> so we say that only, for only if the device is a screen, and, and then we put the, um, and what kind of screen size that we use here? Okay, we're like, now we'll set the min width, min dash width, and we'll say um, 35 rems. Huh, you were expecting, I'll bet you were expecting pixels in there. Why would I do rems? Why would I do a font based breakpoint? Trains really want the size of 35 of your largest or your normalized characters on the screen. Characters, yes. So what I'm saying is if the, if, if the screen is 35 root font size is big or, or bigger, I've got enough characters across the screen that I could probably put two columns in. So um, don't get caught up too much in these pixels in here, right? Because um, you know, to say that a mobile device is 320 pixels today, I guess you know, a mobile device, a medium mobile device is 375 CSS pixels. Well, that'll change tomorrow, right? Those are. It's a very limiting way of looking at, at your breakpoints and making those decisions. But if you're, if you're thinking, if you use your breakpoints based on the content, that's kind of sidesteps the whole issue. It says, I don't care what size, how many pixels you have fit in there. Look at the words, right? If you think about, uh, and that from a typography pr perspective, we look at uh, measure, which is how many words you have on a line before you break to a new line, right? This is a way of thinking about typographically, huh, well, at a certain point, my line length is going to be too long, so let's go to two columns. So you don't need to use pixels for breakpoints. And there's a there's a terrific article. Um, I'll I'll dig that up and I'll share it to you about about using font sizing as breakpoints. 
So we'll say that, and let's see, where do we close out? There's, there's where we close this out. <coughs> and let's change the, we'll just change the, uh, the H1 here uh, quickly. So we'll say font size, three rounds. I'll change the H1 font size when we hit 35 rounds. So inject that there and this here. Save it up. Should be nothing there. But then if I, you know, so it looks a little crazy. It looks okay. The H1 being that size is great. But once we get our screen to a certain size, we want to maintain that visual hierarchy. Let's step up the main heading. Right? <clears throat> cool. If you got that working, if there's something not working, you know, check things like uh, there shouldn't be spaces around here. Um, you know, little things. Make sure you've, you, you're not missing any of the uh, semicolons or you, you haven't deleted a, uh, um, a bracket or things like that. If you got that working, that's great. You've earned your morning coffee. Did I forget my normalized? Mine doesn't, doesn't seem to be normalizing the same way.
So they will archive those. Right. You'd have to answer us on social media with this local navigation on Okay, I mean, how it is actually. Right. So you need a data. I thought just got so known. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, working great. Yeah, that's great. I, I have so much to do here. Check this off. Jeremy. Jeremy's why I did this. Just because it's twisting my hand. And resurfaces all the time. Not the software. So I couldn't get my consideration. My browser did work. And what ended up being was his code calls for hashes of the page. Okay. Into the database. I couldn't get the hash password to save in the database. So when I logged in, it wasn't. It was just the so then we are up. So what I did was I went into my database. I dropped everything. I couldn't get the address. But it took me like four hours of going. Kids screaming in the background. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And now CSS, uh, the only thing left for us to do with CSS is the project wise, is what made it wrong with the product which is a strap. And the final thing. Well, test two, test two. Test one, actually, right? Test two, test one. Test two, test one. And then, 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 and but that's great. I, I, I would check that out. Not being angry with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, uh, I'll I'll that. Yeah. That's great. That's, yeah. Very cool. Like I said, the one is not like I would love to go, you know. I love to go. I think more with it. This is what I struggle with more. Well, because this is actually just no. Jack's because you're there. Like, there's something wrong. That's broken. And it'll give you some clues. CSS will be just like, you ask me to do this. But like, no, that's not what I want. That's what you ask for. So then, it's a really, really, but then you're like, don't want you to do that. It's like, right. uh, but that's this is what you said. Yeah. That's not what's supposed to be. So I want. Yeah. And it was like, so I can't do the right one. So you can do something <laughs> else. And then it goes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm like, whoa, well, that's really yeah. stupid. <laughs> 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 Pro, I mean, hardcore, like, like, you would just do programming. Like, back in, like, that's called hardcore programmers. You don't touch the front end stuff. You know, all the because it's a, it's a logical problem. There's no because your CSS can be perfect. It gives you what you ask for. Like, that's it. But no, you want. Right? But there's just nothing. There's nothing that can be done. And in that case, to, to, to say, well, here's the error. Other than to just say, you know, I'll be packing up and doing the class. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Tomorrow we're at, we're we're doing the Phillips landing platform. So it's kind of more of a Kind of more fun. Well, I think it's on a little bit more of 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 a little Sorry. <laughs> so how do I know backwards? There's only one. There's only three different ways to get to the There's only three ways to get to the You can go through the same of each. Or, and most people who are living in Tali are probably working with the basics. So you're doing the opposite direction. Yeah, I worked in Mid-Mill. Oh, that's from here from Barry. It was like, oh, yeah, exactly. I don't know. It's something wrong. Like, it's something wrong. It's something wrong. It's something wrong. It's something wrong. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, you want to I got, yeah, I got a job right now. Yes, sir. 
And that's a problem. This is this is some of the most important things. But it's still it's still worth it. Yeah, it's worth it. It looks like a month. I'm not going to show up in the kitchen. Dress proper. So that's what I'm going to do. And that happens. Watch the screen. That's what it's going to be. Yeah, yeah. But, but tomorrow it's not. There's, there's not a lot. For example, tomorrow, obviously, I'm going to turn it I just want to start. Same thing. Just practice. Yeah, right? it's good. Just practice. All right. So we've got our we've got our screen or our, our we've got our layout beginning to recognize once we reach a certain width um, we're going to enlarge well we we'll, we can do anything we want but we're going to we're going to boost up the screens the text size of the H1. So if that's working At, at 35 root ends, so that means 35 of the base font size, that is as it's set on the root element, the HTML, um, then we, then these styles then become in effect, right? So that's cool. So let's go to step 4B. We'll snap, snap in another one. We've got the only screen and, so this stuff for, uh, I guess for uh, browsers that can't handle, this stuff so properly. So this one we're still we'll still do min with. So the nice thing about this is, in this case, um, when we're doing when we're doing mobile first and we're we're creating breakpoints that go upward. What if I put here a, another min with, right? That means all of this stuff here still applies. You see what I mean? So, it's, so if I put min with and or min with max width in here. Then once we hit this breakpoint, all of this stuff would get dumped. But what I'm doing is I'm adding to the code as I get bigger, right? So I can put in stuff here. For example, I want the font size to still be three rem once I get even bigger into like a desktop or a TV. So this allows me to not repeat myself uh, as I move upward. There's going to be what, any, anytime you're doing different layouts, like a focus repeat, it's kind of like this big. Okay, now we're this big, but still do all this. Now you're this big. Okay, now you can do this. Well, I, there's going to be some unavoidable things that are repeated when you're when you're doing multiple layouts, but we're going to try and reduce that so we're not doing things twice or three times or four times, right? So where we can, some things are unavoidable, but we'll we'll try and hit them all. So so let's go into uh, another so. Step 4B. Let's go to 60 rems. So we'll say at minimum width, min width, we'll say 60 root ends. Really push, just blowing the doors wide open. Right. Big time. All right. So let's go. Cool. Uh, what should I do? I should just need something to make sure it's working. Main section. <laughs> I don't know. Let's let's just do something to make sure it's working. Uh, maybe we'll font size, font size of the paragraphs, for example. Let's say. Um, so let's look at what have we got in our section heading. So our section paragraph elements here. Let's boost those up. So we'll say main section P. Okay, right down here. I'll just I'll just add this. Right, just before step four D. I'll highlight it there. So this is just inside the breakpoint for where we're breaking, uh, building additional style for 60 rems or wider, 60 root ends. 
And don't get the impression that there's anything wrong with using pixels for your breakpoints. There isn't. It just, it's just, it's just. Don't get hung up on on um, too hung up on on pixels, CSS pixels for breakpoints and saying, well, this is all small devices are 320 and all medium devices because that's a very fluid environment, right? It's like uh, <clears throat> those 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 technical specs on on these devices are changing all the time. So if we we take more of a content focus on our breakpoints. Just look at the content. Say, on a certain point, this line's too long to read. So let's break into, it. and that's why this is maybe a, a different. Let's call it a different approach. So let's let's boost up the main section P. We'll set the font size, and maybe I'll put it to 1.5 rem. So I'll boost that. I'll just boost up the um, font size for our paragraphs. So save that. And save this. We're gonna have to really so refresh your page. Make sure. And I'll have to. I guess I'll have to zoom down here to the paragraph. There we go. So see that. So scroll, scroll down on your screen, refresh, make sure you refresh. Scroll down so you can see the paragraph and then in, make sure you're in responsive mode so you've got the little handle there and you should see it snap up like that. You see, you're looking at the paragraph. You got the, the Actually, I haven't done this that much. Well, the font size isn't changing at all. Okay. Yeah. Let's go back to your phone again. Let's see the. Yeah. Did you let me just see the code below here? Okay. Section D. Try to okay. oh, so save. Save. Save that page. That was the monkey wrench. Those semicolons. Yeah, inside brackets and semicolons. Yeah, get every time. Col commas and semicolons. Where you think you're supposed to put a semicolon? No, don't do that. Hmm. You got a semicolon somewhere else. It's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why would you put a semicolon in there? Why would you do that? Yeah, and then you don't get what you See, want. And you don't get an error. JavaScript, if you mix it, it goes error. And then you go, where's the error? And then you look at it and go, ah. See, if you put a semicolon here, what'll ha what what the because CSS engine awesome. does, it says, you're looking for min width 60 rem semicolon. I'm like, I, I don't even know what that is, so you're not going to get this. Just no. It doesn't give you an error. It just says no. Yeah, exactly. But if you did that in JavaScript, you'd Oh, yeah, red lights. Red lights all over the thing. Yeah. There's a problem here. Oh, you okay. look at it, you go, oh, hey. If you set the font size on the to 100 percent, well, normalize is first. So whatever's in normalize is applied first, and then. Two rems, yes. So that would two times the root m. You so you're setting the body to two 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 rems. Okay, then. Paragraph is three reps. And as you scale it down, why does it scale proportion to have to put the size of your paragraph in the media query? You scale it down because it will dump the media query and that will no longer apply, correct? So this yes. <clears throat> yeah. So yeah. If you're using M's, it will look to its parent as a multiplier. You'd be, it'd be a, a X percent of its parent or 
M's. So the nice thing about root M's is it's looking to the the size as it was applied to the at the HTML. So there isn't you don't get that multiplication of factors. So if you get you get a, a say you set the font size on HTML to 120, and then the body you set to two rem, then it's 240, and then and then inside you put another M or percent, it will base like, it, it keeps going right. So root always has one point of reference, root M. Which is why I think people are moving away from to some degree from M's to REMs. Yeah. In Chrome? Yeah. Yep. This one? Sorry, on the right side. Very select. This one here? Yep. This one here? Yep. Hmm. <laughs> so That's awesome. Never even seen that. Oh. Arya found a really cool goodie. So. Go up in here on uh, in as long as we're in device toolbar. You toggle this. There's a there's a little vertical ellipsis here. And there's something called show the media queries. So even though they're in rems, it will plot them out on the screen. Oh, nice. So that's gold. So you know. Thanks for showing us that. That's great. I like that. That's that's awesome. Yes. Yeah, that's that's a that's a nice tool. And that depending on your you start, when you start to throw more and more tools, you start to get a little bit of you might get into a screen real estate problem. But this is really helpful too because these are CSS pixels, which is really nice. Um, always, yeah. We it used to be they you used to have to install a browser uh, extension to get rulers on if you wanted to see that. Like you had to Firefox had a really cool, a really really popular one called. Uh, I can't remember what it was, Firebug or something like that. You had to install it and had all these tools. But now these ship with. They're right there. That's crazy. That that is that is awesome. Uh, <clears throat> combine that with your rulers, because now we can see also with this with the rulers, I can say, well, that's 35 RAM, but that's about yeah, like I can match that up to I'm around five. What is that? Where's 500, 600? So that's 500 and. Yeah, something like that where it snaps over. That's so awesome. That is so awesome. So cool. Nice. And they light up as they, as they become active. Wow. That's great. Didn't even make any money off that. Free advice, man. Love it. Love it. Cool. Okay, so we got those those breakpoints working. So let's go into uh, uh, step oh uh, step four B step four C. Use the flex box to create the four column layout. So when we're when when things are super big at sixty rems, um, see here main section. We want to circle back. Hopefully, I didn't miss a step. Okay, so we'll get into the main section. So now what we'll do is we're going to use at this point, I'm going to say let's let's lay out those pictures. So we have these uh, each of those sections here, right? Um, are stacked vertically, right? I'm going to say at, when we get to a huge screen like this, um, this is crazy. Like this this image is only 350 wide, so you see it starts to lose a little bit of fidelity there. It's 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 upsampling it, and it's that's no good. Um, let's arrange this in four columns. Put them side by each. So let's use we we'll use flexbox. So how we do this with the main? We simply set flex direction or flex. Sorry, display flex. With flexbox, most of the work you're going to be doing is going to be on the container element, the parent, not the flex children. It'll be on. So in this case, the main element contains these four um, sections. Right? You look at the DOM here. So most of the work, if I'm doing flexbox, will be on. I'll, I'll set most of the properties on the main, which contains the boxes that I want to be flexibly organized. So we'll say display flex. Let's set the flex direction to row. 
So arrange the sections horizontally across. <clears throat> and we'll set the flex wrap, and I'll let them wrap. Like if, you, if I don't have enough space for one of the sections, I'll let them they drop down to the next row. I, you know, I, I won't impose my uh, <clears throat> godly hand. On yeah, I won't like. I won't be like so. Like now. you know, I, I'll I recognize it. You know, like like uh, the spaghetti sauce thing. You know, maybe that people don't want them all in one. Maybe they want them. That's cool. Um, let's set the <clears throat> flex basis basis of the children to so the main section. We'll set them to fifty percent. 50%. So what this will do uh, is they'll look to the parent and use half of that width to render. And since they can wrap, I should get a one, two, and then three, four, right? File save. Yeah, that's what it is. Like over top of each other. Keep them at three. That's neat. One, two. Three, four. Right. Add the bit. Make sure you you've cranked your display. If you, if you don't have that media query, has to fire. You have to get that width up to above sixty root ends, and then that flex box will take effect. So watch your breakpoints. Keep it in responsive. Keep that in responsive mode in the. Okay, so for any of that to actually work, it doesn't matter. I guess it matters where you put the display flex in. Mm -hmm. So you don't want that up in your house. No, you just want to get, you want to look at the direct, you don't the want immediate the children of the main. Of don't put on the body. No, because then that'll start flexing the head, the header and the main and the and the footer. You you want just just the main. I just want to deal with the sections. This, I just want, these are the flexible boxes. So I set that on the parent of those, which is the main. So that's cool. Um, what I also want to capture, though, is orientation landscape. So um, if, let's just say I'm over here, and uh, that right now I'm in orientation portrait, right? But say I, 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 I snap this over here to horizontal. I can I'll pull up a pixel two, for example. Say I want, say the device is horizontal, like like so. Um, in that case, maybe I want to do that. I want to uh, capture that kind of grid, kind of or the, not grid, the the flex box, kind of four four sections like that. If it's horizontal, if it's held, the device is held horizontally, so we can capture that with orientation. So let's go back up to uh, the media query here. So we say min width. And we can capture that with the orientation. Uh, so is this under the menu icon? Is sorry, uh, which, one, which one did I want to do? In step 4A. So let's go up to step 4A. Step 4A here, right? So for bigger screens. So I want to, I want to, uh, I want to see this here. So what I can do is I add another, uh, add a comma in here. Inside the bracket or outside the bracket. And I'll get rid of this so you can see the whole thing. I've added what I've highlighted here. So this comma basically means or. So I'm saying. Uh, media query only screen, so only if it's a screen device. So, if basically if the device can do media queries properly, and the minimum at minimum were at least 35 root m's wide, or the device is being held in landscape. So, or it, I, it'd be nice if they put it had an or instead of the comma, but that's the way it's going. That's it. Okay, so remember the font size gets larger. So here's how that works. So I'll re reload the page. Let's go into, I'm gonna turn off, 
I can hide my rulers for a minute. Um, let's go into, so vertically, I'll reload the page, right? So I'm, I'm certainly below that breakpoint at 35 rounds, but if I, I didn't fire. Oh, well, oh, it's the, it's the H1. H, yeah, so there the H1 is small. And then if I put it in, in landscape, the H1 is now larger. Yeah, but we're working on body of it but for now. Sorry? We're working on the paragraphs and stuff. Yeah, but, in this, but I've gone, because I've gone up to the, the first media query I built, in, like this is... Um, right, right. Oh, yes, it goes up the... The so this is yeah. So the only change I made in this one was the, was that the, I boosted up the H1. So this means that the H1 will be larger if we get if we have like the yes. I'll go to responsive view. So it'll be large if I hit that first breakpoint. Those break that breakpoint visualization is really that's really nice. So if I hit that, there we go. Right or if I'm landscape, and that makes sense because I look if I turn it to landscape. I'm I'm so I, I've already hit that minimum width requirement so anyway. Say, try to make it smaller. Like name a show a phone that's not thirty five. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Applied. Yeah. So I, I think of that you know even even a, a pretty small phone when you hold it sideways it really it comes down to width is what we're talking about. Um, okay, so that's for what step was that? Four D. Can we on to step five? I think so now. Yeah. All right, step five. Uh, okay, we can remove all those. So, but before I actually, before I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in here to uh, talk a little bit about something really strange that you'll see, and it's something you'll see, and I want you to know why you're, you're gonna see it. So, if at, right before we go to step one, I'm gonna put have you put in a really weird tag here. Call it it's a meta tag. And we're going to call it uh, meta HTTP dash equivalent equal to, and we're going to call uh, X. <laughs> I don't usually type this one out. UA compatible. Don't worry, you're not going to have to memorize this one. And then content equal, and the content is. Uh, IE is equal to edge. Put that crazy thing in there. What is that? You're going to see this. And you're going to look at this and go, what is that? Why did they put that in there? So this is actually a, uh, a another vestige from the past. This is kind of a history lesson. So this was, was back when um, Internet Explorer used uh, document modes. So if I pulled up... Uh, do I have IE in here? Internet Explorer? I do have both. So if I have Internet Explorer here. Ask me later. Go away. And let me see if I can pull this up on IE. So this is IE. I think it's IE 11. There we go. So, um, and if I hit F12 for developer tools. You'll see here um, you have document modes, right? So the default is is um, 11. You can change the document mode to IE 10, 9, 8, so on and so forth. Um, and to some degree, you, you'll be able to uh, <clears throat> you'll be able to kind of fake. That's weird. I don't know what I'm doing with the script. I'm not doing any scripting. Um, but you're you can. You could kind of fake and see, well, how would Internet Explorer 9 handle my media queries? And it would sort of break. But the, the idea here is um, this stands for HTTP equivalent. So what we're saying is this is the same as an HTTP header. And those are the things when you hit a server, you know, like the server gets back and says, if the page is found, you get an HTTP 200. Or if it's not found, you get a 404 error, right? Page not found. So this is kind of like, it's it's basically saying, this came from the server, even though it did not. It's the equivalent <laughs> of something. It's saying the user agent is compatible with take IE and force it into edge rendering mode. And that's the most up-to-date standards-based rendering mode that IE had at the time. So this would basically force Internet Explorer into behaving itself. Right? Well, no, we don't care if it doesn't 
Well, it's internet explorer. Do what you want. I, I don't know what to say about this other than um, uh, you know if you if you read read up about this at uh, uh, at MDN or at, uh, sorry at Microsoft Developer uh, Network not MDN but the Microsoft they'll tell you that this is you shouldn't be using this anymore and the reason being is because they've moved they fixed this problem it's called Internet Explorer uh, or it's called it's called Edge and they've again uh, they probably fixed it even more by moving Edge toward Chrome. Chrome based rendering. So, but you still will see this in existing production web applications and legacy web applications. I don't know if I would remove it from a web app, right? Just because you don't like it or you're like, ah, we don't need that anymore. I would leave it in place. It, it's just for older versions of Internet Explorer that couldn't quite, they, they would fall back into an older uh, rendering mode that would do some crazy things. So they might, <clears throat> and I think they have a little, yeah, here's a, See if they, oh no, so they, <laughs> it's not found. So they, um, but if you read up on that, it, so do we need this? I'm not going to give you a hard time if this is not in your, uh, you're not forcing older versions of IE into edge rendering mode. If you're working on an application, maybe at a, at a larger, maybe a financial institution where they've locked down everyone to Internet Explorer 10 or 11 or something like that, I might consider putting it in there. Right? It just depends on kind of where you're working, what you're doing. But I'm not going to give you a hard time if you don't have it. Cool. All right. That's it. Let's remove all the diagnostic borders and margin, colors and margins from header, main, and footer. Awesome. So I'll get rid of that. Uh, where else did I put them here on the this stuff? Main. That's cool. Header section. Header section, footer, enter footer. That's cool. We know it's there. Nav UI, change that background color. Okay. Step five, step one and two. So step five B, change the colors for the header and footer. <coughs> Ta-da! So for the header, I'll do a couple of things here. Let's change the header. We'll start to make this thing look real. Uh, so the header will, will change the background dash color Ooh, that. color and we'll set it to my favorite color of gray and we'll set the text on that uh, the text color which is just color no. white yes. I like it it's my favorite color of gray um, I'll do a purple one, so go for it just make sure it's it's dark. make sure you watch make sure you set the color to a lighter color than the background that's all I care about so let's go down to uh, foot header and footer let's go down to footer down here which is should now be empty we'll set the background There we go. And our foot, there's our footer down here, gray with white. Cool. Now you'll see I've got this ugly white thing at the top here. What in the heck is that? This is the header. It should be, why is there a space? Before I didn't put a space in my header, it's right there. What the heck? Why is there an ugly space in there? There's my header. H1, escaping margin bug. So if I go into the header, H1, look at that. Hey, you're not allowed to do that. Oh, yeah, I can. So that margin for the H1 forces the issue and pushes the whole thing down, escaping margin bug. Let's fix that. Back up to our header. Um, <clears throat> header here. Well, we can either put a margin top zero on the H1, or I can just say add a... Uh, margin top uh, one from uh, 
Now, it doesn't matter where you put the margin or the padding, as long as it's in the header, you're just going to read the header. Like, if you put well, it underneath the color, it would really matter. Uh, I, have to use, I might have to use M well, in this case. Oh, why can't I get rid of that? Uh, margin top, margin top. Why can't I get, oh, margin top. Uh, that won't work. Let's set a margin, let's zero out the margin on the H1. My plan didn't work. A header just below this, header H1, we'll add a new selector, and we'll set the margin up to zero on the header H1, just below the header selector. Escaping margin bug. It'll get you every time. Particularly with headings. All right, so grab that. I'm going to go to the body here and just clean things up a little bit, add some base styles to the body. <clears throat> Let's set, set our font family. We'll just put a sans serif in here, sans. So. And if you're doing some uh, prototyping, I encourage you to change the font. I'll move it away from the default, which is Times New Roman. The only reason I say it is because Times New Roman is the default font, and a lot of times if CSS fails to render, it'll fall back, so it'll look kind of broken. Not that there's anything wrong with Times New Roman, but it kind of looks broken, right? So just, if you're doing any prototyping, at least change the font family to something other than the default. Now at least looks like, okay, we're, doing, we're getting something done here, right? Um, <clears throat> I'll also open up the line height, and I'll put 1.5. So that will just open up. So we have, and that inherits. So for example, like if these lines are too close together for comfortable reading. I mean, my, my, my work here is with this is not to really get too much into the weeds with 1.5. It's just a mul It's just a multiplier. It's just a multiplier. Just a multiplier, just a factor. It, it, it's, it, you can put... You, it doesn't need picks, it doesn't need... No, but if you did... You could, yeah. But the benefit of having a multiplier, if someone boosts up the font size and you set it in pixels, it will, it will like the fonts will swell, right. okay. but the lot, it will, and then they'll collide, right? So, yeah, this allows that flexibility of to size up the font. Then, no matter how, size, how big the font is, it's going to be 1.5 times. Times, yeah, yeah that's right. Size. Yep. It's a lot. Yep. This is where I get. So you can cut the line height. Hmm. So if I'm, if I'm in the low ball for line height. Yep. If I go to the decimal, I want that line height for roof. Yes. So you'd have to put body, line height, 1.8 inside the media query. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, but only repeat the ones where you need to overwrite the style. Like, don't repeat. So design it so it looks good in a single column view in a small screen. Address everything in that view. Then when you get into the media queries, you're doing less work. You know what I mean? So only change what you need to change. Don't 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 reinvent the whole wheel every time. You're, you're adding code bloat. You're adding making it less maintainable. Um, it's it's you're just adding more code, really for no reason. It, it might it might make it more readable from a, a developer perspective to have those things reiterated in the media query, but it's inefficient. That's cool. Uh, step five B. Step five, that's good. We should get all right. We're into step six. But let's lay out the nav and, and the, uh, the H1 and the nav horizontally in the header. 
So <clears throat> here we have, I want in the smaller ver version, I don't want these stacked up here. I want this little hamburger thing over here uh, horizontally. So what I can do here in this, so this is the default, this is not an immediate query, right? This is just in the header right out of the box. So we'll go to step six. And we'll set the header to display flex. So the two children of the header are the H1 and the nav element. Right? So we look at, in this case, we're setting this to be the display flex box. And these are the two children, the nav and the, and the H1. Right? So we display flex. And the default, believe it or not, now they sit side by each. The default is is uh, arranging them in a row, flex direction row. So I actually I, I could put flex direction row, but I don't have to, right? So now they sitting they're sitting side by each. <clears throat> now what I want I want this whole navigation structure over on the right hand side and this H1 over on the left. So I want to move this entire thing over here. So what I'll do is I'll set the justify content and I'll set space between. So all the space, uh, extra space in the flex box, which is this leftover stuff on the right of this, I'll put that between them. Right, so there's the H1. There's, yep. So all I've added here into under step six are those yeah, two. The header just display flex. Yeah, so then when I save this, I haven't refreshed it yet. Then I go, so then there's, so the space is between those two things. Yes, mine hasn't changed at all. So, so what? So it could be this. Could be your uh, semicolon here. Could be justify content is a dash. Space between is a dash. No, I haven't put the justify content. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Like it still stayed. Top and bottom? Yeah. Yeah. Should it should go horizontal just under head by default? Oh, here. See how this coloring changed? I think it was kind of before. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> cool. Step seven. Make the links look better. They don't look very good. So let's set the text decoration. None. It's a small thing you can do to turn off. I don't know. Um, you don't always need to turn turn the underlining off the links. <laughs> Step eight. <clears throat> Style the navigation menu such it's now a box that sits just under the hamburger menu button. So I want this here to sit as a box underneath this hamburger. So this is sort of like we did last time. So there's a few things involved in step eight here. So first of all, we'll turn the, it is a, <clears throat> we're styling now the UL, right? Inside the nav, inside the header. And I think you guys are doing a really good job of using uh, smarter selectors rather than relying on IDs and classes in your code. And I think that's really good. So I, I, I wanna commend you on that. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see that. Um, you guys are using those selectors for what they're good at. I don't see too many people peppering their code with all kinds of IDs and just relying on that. It, you can do it. There's nothing wrong with it, but it, it makes your code makes for code that's hard to maintain and hard to change. So let's go in here. We'll set the display style type or the list style type. None. So turn off, turn off those bullets. Put them down. Now let's take that, we'll position this absolute. 
We're going to take this panel out of, we're going to take this entire block here, this, and this is the nav UL we're styling here. We're going to take that out of the document flow entirely. Position absolute. And when I do that, you'll say, whoa, it's gone. So there it is. It's not it's just kind of off to the side there. It's there. You can see it peeking, peeking around the corner. That's cool. <clears throat> Let's set the um, left to zero. Left zero. There it is over here. Oh, that just looks gross. Yeah, it looks bad. It's okay. We'll set the width to 100%. We'll put a background color, background color, so it doesn't uh, make things underneath it difficult to read. Obscure text. We'll set that to background color. White. What is that? Oh, thank you. We'll add some padding around it. Padding. One rem. I'll put a border around it. Border. 0 0.5 rems. Solid line. <clears throat> Get there. And from the top of the screen, I want to set this. I want to set this down four rems from the top of the screen. So I'm going to set the. I'll, I'll go here. I'll back up. I'll try and keep my um, positioning properties together. So when you're when you're thinking about the order of, in which you uh, uh, build out these rules, uh, try and keep like if you have positioning stuff, try and keep that all together. Oh, sorry. Yeah, four four rems from the top. Four, four rem. There. Is it better practice to use a plus rule here? I mean, when you're just like third go top right and on the left. If you're if you're putting them in order. Oh. Top right. Yeah, yeah, you could. Well, and then at least there's some consistency. I've never seen or heard of anyone suggesting a. Position is position. I, I, yeah, the only thing I've understood is um, so that's cool. That's what the menu will pop up. The only thing I've is is try and group this stuff together, right? And then once you get into color stuff, um, so maybe you know, you know maybe it would be better practice to uh, put this. This is more of a sizing property, so maybe this this should go here, and then finish off with the colors and or font stuff at the end. The reason I ask about the Yep. So, I don't think in this, no, because these are different properties. It's not shorthand. <clears throat> That's cool. Excellent. Cool. Step eight. So we're going to step nine. <clears throat> so hide the navigational list for small screens. So right up. So that's great. We just need this little button up here for the small screen, which is the default, right? So let's hide this entirely. After all that work, we're just throwing it away. Absolutely terrible. And it's gone. Okay, so 
For small screens, wouldn't that be in the media query? No. We're assuming small screen. Yeah, so this is, we're trying to, we're trying to invert, we're flipping things around. Step 10, let's style that, let's style that uh, hamburger menu button. So this time we'll use an ID, menu icon, right? So this is in our code, this we're looking inside the nav. We have this anchor sitting outside of the main navigation unordered list. So I could just I could say nav direct descendant anchor I guess I don't know some sometimes sometimes it does make it a little easier and then if I have any JavaScript that's easier to bolt it to and so on and so forth but I don't have to <clears throat> so that's cool I've used an ID here unapologetically and let's go and say we'll hit display block because it's an anchor right so it's display inline by default. Set the color to white. We'll boost up the font size. And I'll set a margin on the top. Margin dash top. 1.5 rems. And so that should be instead of that ugly blue thing there, getting better. Step 11, somewhere around line 68 ish. Now we want to reveal the navigation menu when the ha hamburger button is hovered over. So it's display, the UL up at the top is display hidden, right? Or display none. So when we, na when we hover over the nav element, the contained, any contained ULs are now display Block. So the, the magic here is the fact that it's the nav that's being ho hovered over, right? It's not the UL itself that I care about. So if you look at the, um, this makes sense because this here, this button, is surrounded by the nav. So if they hover over this button, they're already hovering over the nav, and then we show the UL that's hidden right now. So save that. Reload our page, hover over, oh, and I broke it. Oh, oh, because I'm in a mobile context. <laughs> so now we click on it, which in a mobile context will trigger the hover. There are there is a touch events uh, 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 there's a touch events um, the, the touch events we can we can tie in with JavaScript and and they're they're becoming quite more fully featured so uh, browser vendors are implementing a lot of touch now they they understand that this is a you know we're we're not always in a pointer context with a mouse pointer you're somebody's finger so we're the, we're we're going to be able to access that more and more and very reliably which is pretty cool. But in this case, I don't want to use JavaScript to, to trigger my base navigation, right? Because if JavaScript is unavailable or turned off, then I can't navigate the site. That's a real problem. Cool. Step 11, step 12. Ensure that the links are full, full width and easy to touch. For example, if I click here, right, I, I, I have to go to the text there to hit the link. See how small those are? In a touch environment, I should make this whole big thing a, a bar, right? A, so it should be super simple. 
Well, let's, let's address that. So this is any anchors that are descended from a UL that are descended from a NAT. So that's our, that's our navigation panel. So we'll set the anchors to display block. And I see this in pr production websites all the time. I'm like, wow, here's the navigation system. And they've got this great big button, but only the text part is clickable. I'm like, it's an easy fix. Just set it to block, man. Like, these are, I, I see this in production websites. I'm like, that's a real accessibility problem because you have to, and again, it, it comes down to this whole thinking or we're building for the desktop first. No, we're building for touch first. We're building for a mobile first. Assume as often as not, the person is going to be using their finger, not a mouse pointer. Make those huge. So display block. And if you see the, um, so right now, right, if I click on that, it's really tiny, right? When I refresh that, look how much bigger that is. Just setting the anchor to block. Now I've got a whole width of that. Way easier. And we'll set the anchor color to uh, black, make it a little easier to see. And we'll add some padding too, um, 0 0.5 rems, so half of a font, uh, root font size. I'll make those anchors super easy to hit with your finger. Assume mobile first, assume touch. Make it easy. Don't make it so that you have to use your pinky finger and it's something you'll get you'll make people mad and then try this again and look at that that's that is easy to touch you're thinking well I got to make something friendly to the touch think back to Apple when they said at minimum 40 by 40 CSS pixels for anything you're gonna touch at minimum Bigger if possible. Thirteen. All right. Step thirteen A. Let's rearrange the navigation so we don't use the hamburger on the super big screens. I'm okay with the small screens and the medium screens using the hamburger based navigation, but on super super big screens, I don't know. I've got a lot of space up here. Maybe I could set this up so it's across here. <clears throat> so that's cool. So uh, menu icon here. We'll do a little bit of styling in the menu icon. So we're, at, we're back. Make it bigger. Oh, wait a second. No, no. Uh, where's my last uh, media query? Where's my last media query? Nope. Oh, here it is. We're going to hide the menu icon. Don't need it at this point. <clears throat> um, and what I'm also going to do, so save that. What I'm also going to do as well is I'm going to set the, um, so this will disappear, right? It's gone. I'm going to set the navigation, instead of having it over here to the right, I'm going to actually put it underneath and spread the whole thing horizontally across. So I'm going to set the display, the flex direction to column in the header here so that this nav sits underneath the H1 like it did before. So let's go here to stack the H1 and nav in the column. So step 13B. Header, uh, stack the each one in there. So we set, it's already displayed flex up here, right? You go up to header at the top. This is still in effect, right? So what we'll do, but when you set to display flex, the default is, is uh, flex direction is, is row. So I want to set flex direction now to column for this bigger screen. So I don't need to redo display flex. It's already in flex mode. So let's just go in here. Um, And we'll say uh, flex direction, all of them. Now that won't be won't be visible much because uh, 
It should be, yeah. <clears throat> so we also need to null out the hover behavior on the header nav and render the UL horizontally across uh, distributing the, okay, well, let's see for a second here. Where's my nav? I, I think I've still got it hidden. Yes. Uh, header nav, size up. Oh. Vision display none. I missed a step. Oh, yes. <laughs> so let's go under here the, yeah, step 13C. It's display none. So we're going to change the display here. For header nav UL, which is currently display none, we'll change the uh, display. And we'll set the display to flex. We'll use horizontally. Uh, and we'll set the justify content. Space evenly. So instead of display none, we're back to display flex for, and also that's also going to happen. I have to write header nav hover UL because this is still in effect. So right, so I have to walk. I have to override this. So why would we put that in there anyway? If we're just basically overriding it, because I don't want it to display block. I want it to display flex because I'm going to arrange them horizontally. Display block, I lose the flex box properties, and it will just stack vertically. No, but the other one. Which one? The first display block in the, the header nav UL. Header nav UL here. Why am I putting this here? So what I have to do is, so up here, header, if I go up here, header nav uh, UL, it's display none. Because, because by default, in the small screen, uh, I, I want it to only show when I click this. Right? In the big screen, I'm hiding the hamburger menu. So I need to I need it to show up, as I have no hamburger menu to make it appear. Yeah, so we're doing now we're doing the reverse. So now instead of display none, I do display flex, which is visible. And refresh, and there it is. Now, one of the problems is. Though it is also, I've the 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 UL. If I go all the way to the top here, is also uh, where's my UL here? Is is positioned absolutely, right? So I wanted to. So what happens with with something's positioned absolutely? The container in this case, which is the which is the nav element, which is the inside the header, doesn't recognize. So it in this case. Um, I want it to be contained by the gray header here. So I need to, instead of having it display position absolute, I need to put it back in the document flow. So that means I have to set it back to uh, position static. Let's go back here to, where were we here? Um, Can we just do that up there? No, it has yes. to be down here in, in the large screen version. So I want to display, and then I also want to set position Static. You won't use static too often, but I don't want it positioned absolutely anymore. And as soon as you do that, you'll see then, see the gray thing now. It's now contained by the by the header because it's back in the document flow. Yeah. Yeah. Position relative is still in the flow as well. A position absolute is out of the flow, so that's why the gray box didn't didn't size itself according to encapsulate it because it's like 
it's out there on different layer. Yeah, I just showed the cost of static before. No, static is the default okay. for everything. So you don't have to set static on anything ever, except when you need to take it, except when you change it to position absolute, absolute and you want to put it back in the document flow. So that you won't have to do that very often. But as, as we get into a mobile first, and we're doing these positioning things all over the place, sometimes we have to pull it back into the document flow. Yeah. Um, that's cool. If we got anything else I wanted to style, style up, uh, style up, size up the header nav links. So I've got a, they're, they're kind of tiny right now, right? I want to make these bigger. I've got a lot of screen real estate, so why don't we boost them up? So header nav UL anchors. What are these going to be? These are going to be font size. Uh, One point five rems. Much better. And remember, this is only on the big screen. So I snap this down, right? Uh, so I've broken something. Uh, there we go. No. So on the small screen, I still got this, right? But on the big screen, it snaps to that. Team D. <clears throat> I think I'm in pretty good shape now for it. It's one of four. One A B C D. I don't think I had an E. Nope. So, let's go to D, let's D, see what we're doing at 14. Size up the hammer icon a bit to match the heading. So uh, now we're getting into like so right now that the hamburger menu it, on the small screens, it kind of they don't line up very well. It's kind of looks a bit weird. Let's size it up so it, it fits that. So menu icon under step 14. Bit bigger, that's cool. <clears throat> so let's arrange here. Now we've still got a one column layout here for our medium size layout. There's a small. Let's snap this into a two column layout. We've got enough space. So let's take the main element here and set this to display flex. This is under step 4A, which is our medium bigger screens, not biggest, right, for the main. So set the main to display flex. And we'll set this to <coughs> flex direction row. Which is default, but we'll put it in there anyway. And or you can leave it out, and then we say flex wrap. And we'll wrap that. And the main section, we'll do that grid here. We'll say flex basis. Each one of those should be 50% of the container. Or the 35 RAM, at minimum, 35 RAM or bigger. And what if you set it to auto? Set flex basis to auto? Yeah. It gives you the auto. Huh. You type your flex basis and you send it to It gives me an option. Yeah, auto. Oh, shits and giggles. It could, it probably, if the flex direction is row, it'll probably try and fit them all into one row, I would think, if possible. And if, the, if there's a wrap, 
then start to bump them down the next row. Now I've got two column design, right? Now, of course, now when I get into the big one, I still have a two column design, but I could probably go to four. So let's go down here where we did this here. I meant to do a four column layout, not a two. But let's set, let's set to now to four. So we're down here now on step 4C. We're going to circle back to step 4C and revise this and mess this up. And we'll set the main element here. It's already display flex because of the uh, prior media query, right? So we don't need to rewrite that. But what I'm going to I'm going to turn the flex wrap to no wrap this time. Get rid of that. So instead of allowing them the two boxes to wrap over, but then of course I have to change the flex basis to 25 percent. In effect, what happened to everything else? The flex display, so we don't have to put blow it all away. Blow all that away. All that away, because it's all inherited from the previous two column layout. Did I mess up the? Uh... Yes. <laughs> Flex dash wrap is no wrap. <laughs> because that's consistent. Who wrote? Who who writes these standards anyway? There you go. So we change it to no wrap. We don't allow wrapping of those boxes to a second row, which we do in the prior one. Uh, and instead of using 50% of the parent as a flex basis, each one of those sections are now 25%. And that should give us all four. Four, two, one. <laughs> So it's at the end, it shows us all the closer. Yeah. Wax on, wax off. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> wax on, wax off. Shotgun squeeze. Cool. I think. The only thing I've messed up here is I wanted to align these things together. So this here with this. Yep. Yep. Um, I actually watched uh, Highway Now. Uh, it is absolutely in the It is Yeah. Um, so for a, a, a wearable, um, Things have changed a bit. It used to be we would target for Apple Watch, you would have to write a very specific media query. And it's something like you call it a certain number of max pixels. So below that, it would be something like that. So uh, um, let's say uh, media query for watch, Apple Watch. <laughs> So this is as of this. I was reading this last night, uh, June. As of June, as of basically almost a year ago. Um, so the idea here is it's weird. So what Apple watches are doing is they're they're messing around with this initial scale property, and this makes sense because because this thing here, um, this thing up here was initially a the Apple proposed this right. They're like let's let's clean this all up and get make sure that devices no matter what are rendering in CSS pixels, right? That's what this does. And zero the scale. So don't be scaling anything, set it to zero. This was Apple's proposal. And look what they've done now. They want to change the scale over for all their shit. Of course they do. Buy They're messing products. with it. Buy our products here, jump on this. Yeah. Oh, you want um, an Apple product? Well, oh, Apple. you want that app? You got the buy So what they're app. doing now, um, when the iPhone was first launched, yeah, blah, blah, blah. 
the same report is given to watch watch OS five. So so three twenty pixels is the is the breakpoint for a watch, but the view has been scaled down to zero point four nine to produce layout on the layout on a smaller screen. Remember, this means that the text and images are going to be fifty one percent smaller, but the layout for your mobile, likely to be a stack layout, will remain the same. So it gets weirder all the time, right? So it, yeah. So here's what they're saying, right? Min device width 320 and min device height 357 px CSS pixels. And then they want you to add another meta tag called name equal disabled adaptations content equal watch. Here we go again, right? Uh, yeah. We, <laughs> That's exactly what, when I was reading this, I'm like, I can't even find my watch without my glasses. I don't I can't even find it in the house. I don't even know where it is. So I don't know. This is for, I, I think for, yeah. And that's, and maybe that's a silly thing to say. I don't know. Like maybe. It depends on, for example, um, okay. Okay, so here's the, here's, the, here's the Nest app. I'm signing into, this is a web app for Nest. Maybe, I don't know, like, so right now, this is my home, right? There was my hallway, it said at 18 degrees. The only one at home is my doggy. Let's warm him up a bit. <laughs> right. She'll be like, oh, oh thanks. Oh, it's freezing. <laughs> ah, ah, every, every day, right? So this is cool. Maybe this maybe this would make sense in a wa on a watch. You know? Maybe that would make sense on a watch. Oh yeah. I, I guess. So I, 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 has, I say, yeah, maybe reading a, a, a blog post on a watch would be crazy. But that, that, could, that, you know, I could use this on a watch. So maybe. That is on the watch room. What's that? It's on the watch room. Is that a, is that a, it's an app? Yeah. Yeah, so it's an app. I'm talking about web on a browser. So I'm talking about firing up the browser on your watch and then going to nest.com. Two different things for now. But you will hear more and more talk of PWAs, persistent web applications. That's where even further the line between pulling up a browser and then going to a web application is that much more like a native application that you would download from, from for your mobile device for Android or iOS. Those lines are blurring. Why? Because why are we maintaining a different uh, uh, the code base for this? Right for Nest.com. Why are they maintaining an iOS app, um, an Android app, and a web app? Can't we just build one thing? No. Apparently we can't. This is why we, we have them. Nice we stuff. haven't. We haven't. But my job is to show you is to put you in front of that wave so you can paddle on the surfboard and stand up, and the wave will push you. Right? Let's not chase the wave down. That's much harder. I think. Economics will will and, and I don't know. I think we're getting into point. I think it's really worth your while getting really good at this stuff because I think uh, persistent web apps are, you know, the way to go. So anyway, well, okay. Puppy's getting warmer. <laughs> now we he may not be used to that. So he may not be used to that. Maybe I should cool him down a little bit. Maybe give him 19 degrees. Up like what the heck? Oh, I'm dying here. It's usually not hot during the day. What's going on? So I don't, I, I don't, yeah, I agree. I think that's weird that um, someone would browse, read the New York Times on their watch. But who am yeah, I to say, yeah, you know? I mean, either like your laptop, if you're there. I think I'll take a break. So break you can break. also, now, if you get into this, you can also do things like, um, you can also go here, you can go to edit in your browser tools. You can create a, uh, you can add a custom device. You can say, uh, 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 emulating uh, Apple 
what you hit everything on the Chrome Dev Tools. Oh, that's it. Maybe Google. I don't know. See if they come up with it. Can I edit this? I'll simulate with, yeah, here. Chrome Dev Tools. Show the media queries. Hold on. You can maybe, I think you can add, so you can build out, if you know what you want to do here, show a device frame. Oh, here we go. To add a custom mobile device, click on the device, cl click edit. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. So you add the device name, set the width, the white, the width and height in, in pixel ratios. You have to, you, um, so on and so forth, and you could put in, you could build out a watch here, depending if you need to test for a watch, you can set the pixels. There's a user agent string that the watch will report in as, and you can set that here, which is kind of neat. So wearables, yeah, the craziness continues with wearables, but yeah, I can. So Oh, I'm giving, I'm gonna give you a break. No lab, no quiz, no reading. Okay, you've got lots of stuff. Okay, get go go home, relax with you know. Get you've got lots of stuff on your desk. Ship away. Get that get that to do list going. Um, start thinking about project two. Right. Thanks for coming out and playing my game. Let me just make sure I can I can capture this.